What's up, fish tank people? Old Dustin's Fish Tanks bringing it to you on a technical Tuesday. How's everybody doing? I hope you're doing well. So today, I want to take you back down to the lab, the University of Florida's Aquaculture Lab, where I talk to a couple of the grad students and PhD students and what they're actually working on for their projects. We've got an individual talking about how he's trying to replace brine shrimp, as well as someone who's trying to bring out more of the male characteristics of the better looking males in certain species of fish. This is part two of a three, maybe four part series of just this Florida Aquaculture Lab alone. Click the links around here and check out the first video I did where I got a nice little tour of how they're breeding uh, hippo tangs, the blue tangs, dories, if you will. So check this video out. If you like what I'm doing, hit the subscribe button and that notification button because I'm going live more often. Enjoy. This is your project. What's your name, brother? I'm Shane Ramey. I'm a PhD student here. Cool. And you're working I'm on? Working on masculinization of dwarf gouramis and rosy barbs. And why are you working on the masculinization? Well, we're going to show you. So this is a, a female dwarf gourami. They're a nice fish, but just pretty silver. We're going to take a look at the males. Okay. Love these vat setups. So the males. See, the male has a much more... Red, oh yeah. Stripe red coloring. So yeah. most, most people in the aquarium let me get a good, me get a good shot of him there. Nah, yeah, give, give me that other one there. There we go. Yeah, that's great, dude. The males are way better looking. Right. So, okay. So basically the idea is if you're a producer, you don't want to spend the feed and energy making half females and half males when the males are really the valuable fish. So fish are kind of like reptiles and then their sex determination in this system is kind of plastic. Right. They can be infected, affected by the environment. So we're looking at environmental factors that may help skew populations towards males. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, so this is the other species I'm working with, it's the rosy barb. I saw some fatties in here. I've never seen rosy barbs so wide bodied. Oh yeah, these are big, big, big I mean, are these, are, are these are above, like I don't know if it's what I'm seeing here, but like these guys are thick. There's some big females in here. Yeah. So this is a female. Oh, it helps with the net so it can get the focus. Easy there. Okay. Yeah, those are, she's not sitting still, because I saw them from above. And yeah, that's the that's female. Not, that's not even a big one there. No, no, but you can just see the thickness on them. I got some big ones that were out in ponds for a while. Okay. Pipe's messing you up. Oh, there you go. Right, oh, so nice. This the, so this is the male. Those are hosses, man. Yeah. So, yeah. So, so what are, are there some environmental factors that you're... Can you give us a little more detail about your research? Like what you're... Testing, is it like? We're testing things such as temperature, salt, density, and a few other things. And we also are using the stress hormone cortisol as a substitute for stress and putting cortisol into the feed. Okay. And seeing if, and uh, doing it that way. And then I'm also doing cortisol assays to test the stress level of the fish. Basically seeing if you can get more males than females right. out of uh, it. It works in other species. We just don't know if it works in these species yet. Gotcha. Why'd you pick these species? These are the ones that the industry really wants. These are high volume species that are sexually dichromic that basically the... It's market driven. Yeah, it's market driven. But That's the, cool. These aren't being produced much in the States anymore. They're all being produced overseas <laughs> where they're using methyl testosterone to create all yeah. males. Okay. Cool. Thank you, brother. No problem. Uh, I'm Taylor Lipscomb. What's up, uh, Taylor? What's going on? Thanks for letting me grab a camera in your face. Yeah, this man is, is busy at work here. <laughs> We're at the Tropical Aquaculture Laboratory. And what are you working on, man? Um, my project is focused on uh, replacing Artemia as a first feed item for ornamental fish. And what are Artemia? Artemia are uh, brine shrimp which are a wild collected organism um, that are decapsulated, hatched, and then fed to uh, larval ornamental fish. Um, so the issue with Artemia right now is there's some pretty extreme uh, market volatility going on. Okay. There's some uh, heavy increases in price and availability is also in question. Um, so we're working on testing out commercially available 
dry micro diets as an alternative to um, Artemia. Okay. Do you have anything that you could show me uh, with that? Let's go look at. Let's do um, it, man. So these are Artemia. And if I can get you to talk ones. close to the thing, oh, it's sure, a little. Yeah. Artemia hatching. All right, so we got the it's brine shrimp hatching, right? Yep. So this is, uh, you know, a small scale of what you'd see on a farm. Basically, the the Artemia when they come in, they're just in a jar um, or a can, and they need to be decapsulated and then hatched out every day. Um, so it's a fairly, you know. So you got these labeled here. Yep. So these these were hatched out Sunday. These were hatched out Monday, and we do it every day. Wow. Um, How do you hatch them? Basically, they're they're a saltwater organism. So we fill up the cone with salt water. We add our decapsulated brine shrimp um, and aerate it, and they hatch out on their own. Um, it usually takes like 12 to 18 hours under our conditions for the for the artemia to hatch out and be able to be fed. Um, so the you know this is this is another component that the farmers are a little bit concerned about. Is it takes you know a fair amount of manpower to sure. do this as opposed to you know we can walk into a freezer and uh, grab our you know whatever micro diet we're looking at and drop it in. Fish. Yeah. So, that's, this is so, the, so you're researching this stuff yep. to see as an alternative to that stuff. There you go. Yeah. And how's that going so far? It's it's going great. We've got some good results. Um, it's all unpublished at this right, point. Right, right, right. Sure, sure, yeah. sure. But that's so. All right, that makes sense because they're having issues with this because it's labor. So, labor and that's and, and cost. Labor so and the, cost. The cost is going up dramatically. Um, Why is the cost going up? It's availability. Um, these are wild harvested cysts. Okay. So they're harvested for the most part in two areas in the U.S. Uh, the Great Salt Lake and then San Francisco Bay. Okay. Um, the Great Salt Lake is actually at its lowest level it ever has been. Really? At currently. Um, and then also it's you know it's really dependent on environmental cues. Sure. So these Artemia kick off a big bloom of cysts. Um, you know, depending on the environment. So um, basically volatility and the availability of it is driving cost. Out. Gotcha. Yeah. And why did you pick this as your research project? Well, it's something that's really important to the farmers. Um, they're really heavily dependent on this organism to feed to their fish. Sure. Um, and it's, it's something that if I can provide information for them to be able to have another option, they may not use it to replace Artemia right away, but at least it's a you know a safety net in the event that Artemia becomes unavailable. Because this is the core, one of the core things they feed at all the farms around here. Yeah. That's awesome, man. Yeah, just a larval fish for the most part. Um, you know, I'm just walk to around and show this side here. Critical early life stages. And then when you harvest some, you just open those and let them out, and they go in, or yeah. So we put a net under here, a brine net and harvest them. For the small scale stuff that we do, we just grab a small brine net and net them out and put them in a pea cup and then we're off and run. Cool. This is kind of the, the basis of the rearing system that we use to test the diets. Okay. Um, among many other things. So we can uh, easily replicate, you know, small scale tanks and provide good data that we can run statistics on and and uh, provide good recommendations. So those are some uh, larval rosy barbs that are they're under a different thing. But these are sure. larval dwarf gouramis. You can wow. barely see them in there, kicking around. You want to give me a quick tour, or what you got? I mean, is there like gouramis here? Give me like the what's? Yeah, these are all of these are larval rosy barbs. Okay. Um, they were actually a I saw the experiment. So he's uh, he's working on masculinizing sexually dichromic fish. Okay. So in the trade, sexually di dichromic fish are kind of an issue because you have, say, a whole pond full of rosy barbs, and only the males are colorful. Right. So the females aren't worth almost anything. Right. Um, so they, you know. You they, said it. Yeah. No, I'm kidding. That's right. <laughs> so. Um, he's working on different ways to masculinize the fish Got it. in early life stages. 
Um, and these are all dwarf gouramis that we're doing larval feeding experiments with. Um, right now, we're taking samples from these tanks to evaluate different digestive enzymes. Um, so the, the feeds can impact the way that the, the fish digest food. Um, so we're evaluating that right now. And then what are you working on here? You're actually... Just taking the sample. So I've got little dwarf gouramis in here. Little larval fish. I don't know if you can see that. No, There's one but... right there. Okay. So we're gonna um, evaluate the way that these fish are digesting food, basically. Awesome. Well, man, thank you so much for the, the time, bro. Appreciate it.